This exhibition was born from an observation I made some time ago that even though the climate crisis, global warming, is probably the single greatest existential crisis faced by mankind in its 300,000 year history, you wouldn't necessarily be able to tell from the relative paucity of contemporary artwork that responds to this crisis in the cultural mainstream. I think that one of the reasons why we're at this juncture is that, you know, perhaps the problem is just simply too enormous to be dealt with responsibly. Paradoxically, because it is such a global phenomenon, I think that for art to really make sense of it as a creative challenge will require the mobilization in a way of local means. You know, we're talking about one artist duo and then three more individual artists, all of whom live in Chicago, right? You know, all of their work could proverbially have been gathered here on foot. There's two works in the exhibition by an uh, artist duo uh, composed of two German artists, Beate Geisler and Oliver Sun, and they have made two photographs of uh, horseshoe crab. They're beautiful pictures, um, but they're also quite poignant, because as it so happens actually, just a week before the exhibition opened, there was an op-ed in the New York Times about the horseshoe crab. The op-ed basically talked about the fate of the horseshoe crab as the single oldest living animal on Earth. Um, it's been around for 450 million years, has survived multiple mass extinctions. And of course, as can be expected in a way from the very narrative, it is of course now facing the threat of an extinction of its own. So they're, you know, they're beautiful pictures um, and obviously um, unsettling in their beauty. You know, if you kind of want to capture the idea of the aesthetics of catastrophe, the beauty really of, of uh, of disaster, then you know this is a very, very convincing um, case in point, I believe. So Beat and Oliver also produced a new work for this exhibition, which they named the score. The title of the work is "How Does the World End for Others," which is a text piece composed of 47 fragments taken from what one might call classics of the emerging cli-fi genre. Cli-fi is short for climate fiction. In 2030, drinking water has taken over oil as the vital commodity people and nations fight over, a situation brought on by drought and global warming. They basically combed this library for 47 literary fragments, which they isolated and used as the building blocks of a score, which they had read as by way of performance at the opening and there will be another occasion later on. Jenny Kander's underground library is composed of um, a number of non-fiction volumes devoted to climate crisis and every time that Jenny is invited to participate in an exhibition and the curator in question expresses an interest in this particular piece she will burn um, a number of books, but using the so-called biocharring procedure, which is basically a carbon negative way of disposing of waste in the form of a book, paper and the like. And the books are displayed on a custom-made shelf that is made up of ash wood. And ash is a tree that currently in the Midwest is under great threat of mass extinction thanks to an invasive species known as the emerald ash borer. A second work that Jenny is presenting in the context of the exhibition is a piece that she made collaboratively with Andrew B. Arnott. Um, and the title of the piece is Whale Bells. It, it consists of eight hand-blown glass chimes, each of which hang from a rope that is tied into a knot. And inside the knot, you can actually see the traces of some bizarre geological presence and that presence are actually fossilized ear bones of an extinct whale species very closely related to the humpback whale. The bells can be rung and obviously you know kind of the somewhat gloomy somber tone of the ringing of the bells conjures this image of course of you know the notion of an alert an alarm. Dan Peterman is a long-term resident of um, 
Hyde Park to dance present in the exhibition in, 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 in two different guises. Uh, there's a big piece outside on a terrace that's called Archive of 57 People and then scattered throughout the building but also shown here inside the gallery. Archive One Ton is basically one ton of recycled plastic dating back to the 80s, all of which was compacted into the objects that we now see, uh, these kind of you know, flat sheets of greenish, grayish plastic that really look like books. You know, Dan was born in the early 1960s, and he's in many ways a child of a moment in time that thought of plastics as just the future, right? As a promise of, of, of you know, endless consumption in a way. And, but you know, throughout his life, he's also seen the atmosphere around the notion of plastic exchange. And now we think primarily of plastic, not just as a nuisance, but as kind of a grave threat to the natural environment. Easily the most enigmatic artwork in the exhibition, I would say, is a, is a small diptych made by Inigo Manglano Ovalle, which consists of one half is a, is, a, is a newspaper photograph, a grainy newspaper photograph of a young Dustin Hoffman. And then the other side of the picture is just kind of a monochrome red plane. So the title of the work is 18 West 11th Street, New York, March 11, 1970, which is the location and the date on which the picture were made of Dustin Hoffman standing in front of a townhouse in Greenwich Village, which, which was blown up by accident by um, members of the Weather Underground who were busy making bombs in the basement of the building in question. And Dustin Hoffman happened to be a neighbor. He was just there, complete fluke. So the work uh, kind of relates back to a long-standing interest that the artist has in the idea of the Weather Underground as a terrorist organization, a domestic terrorist organization, as it was called by the FBI. Uh, which, you know, kind of used the, the notion of weather as a metaphor for, you know, a variety of political purposes. I have no interest in mounting an exhibition like this in preaching to the converted, right? Everyone who comes to see an exhibition like this knows the dire straits which we find ourselves in. And I also do not necessarily want to um, add to this kind of pervasive sense of, of catastrophilia almost, right? This kind of like artistic addiction to catastrophe. I mean, I hope to a certain extent that it will activate a will to be more conscientious about living in a way that can change things for the better. But I'm just kind of interested in the idea of artistic practice as uh, in essence propositional, uh, a way of doing things and making things and, and crafting things that proposes a path towards a set of solutions.